another story. Uh, but I, I, like, I like to think that there is a collective conscious. But, but we are all born into, and when we absorb, as we as we develop, we we, we we assimilate the patterns around us, and we these, these vibrations and quantum thought forms start, quantum wave forms start to become language and colour and distance and shape and meaning. You know, so um, with a whole vast swathe of who we think we are is, is actually something that we absorbed but simply by being in the environment in which we've been born into. And um, now I, I find this, this quite interesting for, in, a, in a number of ways. Um, and, and one is that it suggests that whatever problems the world has today are based around the, the, the problems in the story of the world. They're based around the problems in, in this uh, collective mind that we, that we manifest into. And but we need that, that progress in terms of uh, the real aims of life, you know, so the, the sustaining life and, and supporting uh, the, the continued existence of humanity, the continued uh, qualities that, us, that we all value as individual human beings. Um, but, but this is based in this... Um, collective consciousness. So, uh, if any individual person um, sets out in their life to, to make a difference, what they're really making a difference to is this collective mind, because it's only if it's there in the collective mind when they when their lives are over that they could really be said to 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 have made a difference to anything which will carry on after them. It's not a force inside our heads. It's it's the force manifested into the the collective consciousness. And um, by going back into the story of the um, old cultures, and by learning anew, by looking anew at the, the wealth of, it, of humanity that, that the tribal cultures actually represented, uh, contrasting that with both the benefits and the innate problems of, uh, of civilization. And synergizing a, a new way forward that really represents the best of the potential of everything we are now, create a new collective consciousness or, or evolve, not what I'd like to use necessarily, but evolve uh, a, a new way. You know, so these are the messages that I take for, for what, what it means for us in community today. You know, is that by, by, by examining this stuff, we can start to forge something new. Okay, well, um, I guess there any any questions at the moment? I always want for questions. Um, I, I've probably sort of said this in quite a few different ways, but I find this is one of those subjects which is kind of quite multidimensional. You have to sort of look at it in, in quite a few different ways to sort of get get the whole sort of feel of it. So, has anyone got any questions so far? You don't have to have questions. It's a very interesting uh, book by William Golding, The Inheritors, which talks about the same thing we're talking about. William Gold, I've not heard about that. Inheritors, which is really talks about the tribes before they met the modern sort of so called the civilized. Right. Place. And they talk about how their feet were so clever. Yes. And understanding the land that they're walking on. And understood how logs they saw logs different way, like let's say they saw wood in a different way. Yes. So the modern civilized uh, Homo sapiens saw look, how they saw wood as well. Totally different relationship. Well, it, well it, it makes sense, doesn't it? You know, I mean, we, we see a tree and we think, oh, there's a nice bit of timber in that. Yeah, you know, that, that's what we want it for. You know, they see a tree and it's part of a whole continued pattern of life. And they, you know, what they don't want is a dead tree because the dead tree is no good to them. You know, so they've been able to live in a tree. I, mean, like, I don't know exactly how they how they relate to that tree, but they certainly wouldn't look at it as simply something to exploit. They'd look at it as part of the totality of everything, you know, the interdependence of everything. Then they would become desensitized. Desensitized, because our sense is what we use before. Yes. We well, absolutely. Because yeah. I mean, having sort of looked at the past a bit, I think mean, I've pretty much covered um, what I wanted to. To, to offer about the past, especially pictures getting past this myth that tribal people actually had vast amounts of time for personal interests and culture and art. They just didn't see the need to have art that was permanent over thousands of years. You know, their art was in the, was in the shared collective, you know, and, and it was passed on 
Uh, and so the way they looked at art and religion and everything else was very different. Uh, but uh, I, I got past that term, that myth. Oh, I mean, another thing about tribal culture and civilization is the role of leadership. Because in a tribe, uh, leadership was always based upon uh, ability. You know, it, it, it was based on, you know, the best hunter leads to hunting. You know, the best forager leads to foraging. The best healer, you know, leads to healing. And, uh, you know, that, that was... That was the whole sort of how they related to, to the idea of leadership in the tribe it was based around who is the best individual for this particular job. So these weren't fixed roles, you know, they, they changed over time. And um, you know, leadership was seen as an obligation for the good of the community, for the good of the tribal family, you know, which is enormously different to what has developed over the course of civilization, uh, which of course is, uh, is leadership as a, as a privilege based on bloodline. You know, and, you know, why is the queen on the throne? Because of her DNA. There's not any other innate qualities she's got. Different DNA, she'd be cleaning it instead. You know, that's, that, that's, that's the disparity. You know, tribal culture's leadership was based on ability and was an obligation in civilization leadership not so much in the last hundred years, perhaps, though we look a bit deeper and maybe it is still there, but certainly uh, through the whole sort of history of royalty was, was based around who conquered who, who's got control of that grain store, who's got the size of the swords to put in the guts of anyone trying to take grain out of that grain store, we've got bloodline, you're the rule. Yeah. That, that was quite a different story indeed, really. Um, but I have another point to, to make up, to, to, uh, to bring forward in that. And of course, another one, another myth, another myth which we should explain while, while we're at it, life expectancy. You know, a civilization is great, you know, civilization, you live longer, you're happier, healthier, you've already kicked the free time one into touch, because that clearly isn't true. Um, but uh, all the way up to the Industrial Revolution, in fact, probably just a little bit beyond the Industrial Revolution, there is no discernible difference in lifespan between people living in a tribal culture and people living in a civilized culture. If anything, the tribal culture was a little bit better. Yeah. Unless, wow, well, until until the sort of um, until conquistadors went to South America and the life spaces plummeted, you know. But um, but that's you know, uh, and, and people went with smallpox blankets and to to uh, to infect the Native Americans. You know, until that sort of thing happened, anyway. Uh, the, the life expectancy of tribal culture was absolutely equal to life expectancy in uh, in civilization. So really, what, what we have to off, all we have to really hold up about civilization is saying, well, we've got antibiotics, and uh, we've got you know, sort of we, we've learned how to how to not have not have uh, sewage running through the streets, which we hadn't really got the hang of uh, until the Victorians. Uh, so, uh, and yeah, as a result, we we can live to sort of. 70 years or so now, uh, but without those, without those drugs and without the basic improvements in, in hygiene, you know, that, that's such a new development in the story of civilization. You know, uh, it's something of a joke, really. Um, so we kind of get into, began getting into the um, <clears throat> into the uh, into the modern day, and uh, I mean we can see that you know from the point of view of the stories that civilization has told its own people because. The nature of any culture is going to be, you say, our culture's best, uh, has been something of a sort of sleight of hand, really. Uh, because it's been about sort of saying, hey, you know, we're a civilization, so you've got more freedom. But really, it's been about more dependence. You know? So that, that's, been, that's been quite an interesting sleight of hand in itself. But then we get to the 20th century, where the, the power of stories really start to be unleashed um, through... Uh, for use of psychology. Um, I talked about this a bit in, uh, in my last talk, um, and these, these, these characters, um, Bernays and Strauss and, uh, and Nash. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to um, reinvestigate that completely, uh, but I think it's something that we you know, should, should keep a focus on. Um, Bernays, of course, was the nephew of Freud, who in the um, early 20th century uh, started to link uh, psychology to advertising. 
and uh, based on based on the power of his, of his uncle's theories, and starting to link products 